we welcome you to the first talk of Chobi Mala 10. And we have four very special people. There's Kunda Dixit on the extreme right, um, the editor of Nepal Times. He has been a journalist for many, many years. He has taken classes at Patshala, but also he was the person who set up uh, Panos South Asia many years ago. Um, and has been involved in the media scene in many, many ways. Then we have Thanvi. Thanvi. My introduction to Thanvi is because of this fabulous work that she and her team did to get me released. I don't know if that's the best definition for her, uh, but uh, do we have a copy of that book, Thanvi's book here? The one where you wrote the piece, beautiful piece on photography? Why don't you tell us? The one that I just got as a present. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, the one that Shahidul is actually referring to is not a piece authored by me, but uh, during the Free Shahidul campaign, we uh, had commissioned a long form piece because we're a long form magazine at the Caravan in India. And we were tracing his history and his contributions, not just in Bangladesh, but also abroad, but all trying to build a personal and a public history and the importance of the voice being heard in a place like this. Uh, that's not what I was referring to, but that'll do, because it mentions me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, from, from a journalistic point of view, what, one of the things we wanted also was to have a South Asian uh, context, because right now, as you're well aware, the tension between India and Pakistan is there. Bangladesh has historic roots uh, with links with both of those countries. And I think at a time like this, why it is relevant to mention that also is one of the things that happened while I was incarcerated was this solidarity we developed between professionals in South Asia. And I think one of the messages we need to get across is uh, the fact that while our nations might have their own agenda, at a public level, we want to work together. We have these long cultural links, and there is so much brotherhood and sisterhood amongst us, and we would like to inculcate that. Nurul Kabir is the editor of The New Age and um, probably the biggest troublemaker in the country. Uh, as a result of that, um, his, his voice is very revered and respected, but also feared. And we now look out for the rare glimpses of Kabir we will find on a few talk shows, because every now and then, there's a television channel that feels we can sneak in a Nurul Kabir, but it doesn't happen for very long, sadly. Uh, but really, the most outspoken journalist we have in the country, Renuma Ahmed, she is a writer and an anthropologist. There is some relationship with me, but I won't mention that. Um, uh, but uh, she, uh, the book that she has in front of her, uh, Tortured Truths, is a book she brought out when Bangladesh was under a caretaker government, but effectively under a military-backed government. Uh, and that, too, was a particular time when there was a lot of censorship um, and a lot of our freedoms were eroded. So this is a book that deals specifically with the political situation in the country at that time. I'm not going to take any more time. The session today is on freedom of thought, freedom of expression. And I will leave it up to them. I'm requesting Kobe to chair it and be a panelist himself. Over to you, Kobe. It's a very good afternoon to you all. I believe, and as I have been uh, informed, that we have in the audience very serious people, artistic people, creative people from uh, across South Asia and beyond. And you know that freedom of expression, freedom of thoughts and conscience is something that the people across the world have been fighting for years. There are uh, good situations in some countries, there are uh, bad situations in some, uh, some others, but all of us know that the uh, world communities, the people at large, have not yet been able to attain the stage that they will make uh, themselves happy in terms of uh, thinking, in terms of uh, uh, 
expressing their thoughts. And thus, implemented thoughts that they think are being imp uh, by political activism. And now that we have, and particularly in South Asia, the state of the affairs in terms of freedom of thought and conscious, conscience, and is, uh, the right to express, uh, it gives a, a very a, a bleak uh, message if you just consider the latest indexing of the state of things in this part of the world. I will just, before I begin and uh, request one of our panelists to start, I will just give a small data, <coughs> particularly the uh, South Asian state of affairs in terms of the subject that we are to discuss now. The place, the venue, Bangladesh is ranking in terms of freedom is 144th. Pakistan is 147, India is 133, Nepal is 105, Maldives 112, Bhutan 94, Sri Lanka 141. That's this ranking. So this speaks of two, three things. One is we have the least opportunities in this part of the world, in South Asia, to think freely and express them freely. And this is directly related to the state of democracy that we have. Officially, in all the countries we have at the moment, is a democratic uh, dis uh, compensation. But to make this democracy a people's uh, uh, a method to implement their ideas, their aspirations, we have our governments. They don't like us or many of us among the intelligentsia who are divided in political line in across South Asia, who love to uh, tie with these or that uh, political parties, which is also a very serious impediment towards the, uh, towards the implementation of the uh, right to the freedom of thought and expression. But you all know these are the people in South Asia that who need it most. In Bangladesh case, there is a very interesting thing. We have our constitution originally adopted in 1972. They say in the constitution, you are free to think. The freedom of thought and conscience is unconditional. There is no bar. Then said, there's a different article of the constitution, freedom of expression. This freedom of expression, you are free to think, but you are not free to express. Says, if there is a reasonable restriction imposed by law, then there are certain definitions in terms of what you cannot express your thoughts freely. Well, now the reasonable restrictions, what is reasonable to the governors, cannot, may not be reasonable to the people. And usually this is one of the uh, major, major uh, issues, even in the West, that how the elected governments of the people in, is soon stands in the way of the implementation of the aspirations of the people. That's one of the serious uh, uh, crises or uh, issues to be thought out by the political science, uh, scientists of the day. So our problem is very, uh, very, uh, rather very crude. One doesn't have to see. Those of whom you, you know, uh, Shahidul Alam is uh, enough example that he had been in jail for several months because of uh, one of his thoughts uh, he expressed was some information that he was exposed to uh, just communicated to the people uh, across the world. So under this situation we are going to talk about this. Yesterday uh, so my great friend, respected friend Ranuma paid a visit to our, to our office. And while having a cup of tea, asked me what you were going to say tomorrow. First, I thought, is this censorship, censorship itself? Why she wants to know what I'm going to, what I'm going to say? 
Then we came to understand that we have to think these days to, uh, to think and uh, express things. So I'm in a better position here out of the four sitting uh, so on the days that I know I do some uh, public talks in televisions. Well, uh, not for uh, no, uh, not uh, uh, these days because I'm being but uh, uh, to be invited by the most of the television producers. But I know from practical experience, empirical experiences, that who conduct and organ uh, to conduct any program, people don't like him or her to speak more. So that's the advantage, I don't have to talk much. That's what I, to to I told Ranuma. So onus is on them. Let us start the talk. So by, uh, uh, I, I should rather uh, say the most senior, most experienced, uh, famous journalist present here, Kunda Dixit. Well, I don't know about famous, but infamous, definitely. Um, um, Nurul Bhai talked about the list, uh, listing of press freedom and South Asian countries being at the bottom, um, I think, quarter of it, uh, 144, 125. Well, Nepal at present is 105, but it goes up and down. These rankings are not static. Um, for example, two and a half years ago, Nepal must have been 160. It's just that at the moment we are on a, on a, on a top curve. Um, three, three years ago, some of us had to go into exile, others had to go underground. Uh, there was persecution by various agencies of government. And I think countries in our region come in and out uh, of these uh, threats. Um, and the joke in Nepal used to be that uh, we have freedom of press now, but maybe not freedom after press uh, or after printing something. Um, but the trend throughout the world, as we all know, is that um, you no longer need tyrants and despots to silence the press. Um, elected leaders have found out that they don't really have to kill journalists anymore. They can just kill journalism. It's much more effective. And it's almost as if they're all using the same formula and uh, as if they have Skype conferences once in a while where to exchange notes. This is how we do it. Uh, because the formula is almost exactly the same whether you go to Turkey, Philippines, the US, Italy, and now UK. Um, you know, you, you undermine journalism, call journalists uh, prostitutes, or you call them the failing uh, New York Times, or call it all fake news, and you repeat that message over and over again through a compliant media so that journalism itself then loses its credibility and anything you write against these people then uh, is blunted. And, and the modus operandi for them to get elected is to use populism, um, xenophobia, racism, bigotry. Press now, which 
tends to be anti-nature, anti-gender, anti-inclusion, anti-multilateralism, and anti-press freedom. It's almost as if the press itself is uh, trying to undermine its own freedom. And um, <clears throat> now that the mass media is under control, the next target is the social media. Because of its freedom, its latitude, its um, uh, level playing field, that is the new threat. And again, once more, they're doing these like, Skype conferences to borrow each other's methods to control social media. And, and you can see the same thing everywhere, that you use cyber laws, privacy laws, defamation, um, to, in order to use that as an excuse to, to constrict uh, the freedom uh, of the net. And uh, new laws have been passed uh, in Nepal. Uh, very soon, um, this has been done here, I suppose, and other countries around the world. Um, and so I think this is what we have to be vigilant about. I mean, nothing of what I've said is new to you, obviously. So what do we do about it? I think that's the question, and we can have that in the discussion later. Thank you. For now, I'm sure. So. So, well, there's a very interesting thing that uh, Mr. Kundo was speaking, that new, new laws are coming into being. See, here, the ICT Act, under which our great friend, uh, Shridul Alam, has suffered. The very interesting thing about it is, in Saudi Asia, at least, we can see the different government has some kind of solidarity in terms of uh, oppressing the uh, dissenting thoughts. Because one state comes up with a new law, it fo the others follow. The very the same kind of laws are coming into being in this region. So that reminds me of one of the uh, serious concerns that journalists at the same time uh, should think about is, if the ruling classes of the, or the governments of the different uh, countries have their solidarities, uh, in terms of uh, following each other, in terms of uh, oppressing public opinion, why not journalists forge a real, a real solidarity among themselves to uh, resist the government moves? While we'll be discussing it more, maybe some of you can uh, think of that, because uh, when you have you are exposed to the same kinds of problems by the same kinds of institutions in every country, government uh, in the first place. So the uh, journalists working, working in different countries uh, need to really, really force solidarities to protest things together. We know that we have our different organizations, but at the same time, uh, we also see um, that uh, in the name of some South Asian solidarities or Asian solidarities, most of the uh, gatherings become picnic parties. They meet each other, talk good things, but eventually not, nothing comes out. Think that the way that things are moving, we think it's important to have some effective solidarities among South Asians who are serious about or respectful about their own thoughts, I must say, because uh, to come back to the original uh, point that I was trying to say, that when you say that you are, you are free to think, but you are not free to express. But there's a very serious organic interrelationship between the two. If you continue to think good, but you cannot, you cannot uh, express them properly, or you get punished for you have, what you have thought and expressed, it, what imp actually happens is people ceases to think subconsciously. It's a, perhaps the brain cells, I mean, the, the other scientists could, would be in a better position to say that, ceases to, ceases to remain active because you, cannot, you can think we can exist if uh, uh, you cannot express. If it continues for decades, why should people think? So, so this is even for our uh, existence as creative human beings who can think should also work for the greater spaces for freedom of expression. Now, uh, so I would request our Indian colleague, 
It's a very tense situation in this half continent going on. And it's very jinguistic times when two countries, two states, I should rather say, are uh, engaged in clash. Journalism becomes very, uh, really, really very difficult because the governments at, that, at these kind of times uh, expect their journalists to become public relation officers of their armies or the governments. So it's very difficult to be uh, to remain journalists instead of being uh, public relation officers of the governments to tell the truths and half truths, whatever the governance fit. And under these circumstances, we have our great friend here. So I would request you to uh, speak on the theme. Something that you mentioned, Kabir, uh, of journalists being public relations officers reminds me of um, a book um, by Janet Malcolm called The Journalist and the Murderer, where she says, what gives journalism its authenticity and vitality is the tension between the subject's blind self-absorption and the journalist's skepticism. And somewhere that skepticism seems to have disappeared in journalism that we see in the mainstream media, at least in India today. And she also said the journalists who swallow the subject's account whole and publish it are not journalists, but publicists. And that we can see that is clearly at play in India, not just now with the current situation, but um, it has happened over time. For us to say that it is only happening with the current administration would be wrong. It is happening at a much more in a much more organized way this time. But this has happened in India before. During the emergency, a lot of press freedom was pushed down. And there was, there were only one, there was actually one main paper, Indian Express, that was fighting against the establishment and trying to bring the voices out. What we've seen in the last, uh, since 2014, when the current government came in, the broadcast media has been completely bought out. And, and the way that uh, a lot of this influence works is money. So so it's the capital that is controlling everything. Now, where is where are all the news agencies getting funded from? What uh, what relationship does that funding have with the establishment? And once we start to trace those ties, then you see that it's all actually quite interlinked. So it's not a surprise that broadcast media is not putting out. Um, there is no skepticism within broadcast media. If you follow what has happened in India since 14th February, since the Pulwama attack, um, there is a there is a sentiment that is being fanned uh, of, uh, it is a pro-war sentiment. And the journalism is not supposed to be putting, it's like journalists are not supposed to be putting their personal sentiments out. It is their responsibility to report what is on the ground. And you know, I work in an organization called The Caravan, and I joined the organization two and a half years ago. And I've been privy to, uh, the process of reporting in an extremely, um, in a manner that I've actually not seen across Indian mainstream media. What is reporting? What is sourcing? Whose accounts are you willing to take? If you actually go through a lot of the newspaper accounts that have been coming out, um, they have anonymous sourcing. They're, a lot of their accounts are not getting vetted. Anonymous sourcing is not a bad thing, but then you ha need to get it vetted from two or three other places for it to hold, for the for the argument to hold. And you know, when you talk about solidarity, we've experienced actually a complete lack of that amongst our own colleagues in India. Um, a week ago, uh, we published a piece which was looking at um, the caste composition within, uh, amongst the men who died in the Pulwama attack. There were 40 Jawans who were killed, and uh, there was a journalist who approached us, and we weren't his first choice of publication. However, whichever, whichever organization he went to, they said, no, we're not going to run this. And this is not the first time that it happens. We get a lot of journalists who come to us saying, oh, we went to so-and-so, we went to so-and-so, we went to so-and-so, and then we came to you. And it's a bit disappointing being like, you could have just come to us in the first place. But, uh, and. So when we did publish this piece, we knew that the question of caste is an extremely sensitive question in India, um, as is the question of race in many other parts of the world. And one does have to deal with it sensitively, but that doesn't mean that we don't bring these issues up. Now, uh, as soon as that piece went out, of course, there was a lot of hate mail, which has become a very common thing now, Twitter, Facebook. Um, there was a lot of social media uh, rhetoric that was going around. However, something that we felt 
that we haven't felt in many other pieces was that um, there were many calls that were coming into the office and you know the usual that you know you are anti-nationals how can you do this and the main idea was don't divide our country on the basis of caste and that you know the idea that journalism is not even supposed to bring up these ideas because if you actually expose the caste composition only 12 and a half percent of the people who died in that attack were upper caste so who are the people who bear the brunt of war and who are the people who are actually fanning this idea that we should go to war how many of the people in the upper class and upper caste um, uh, you know, communities are sending their own people out. And who is the one who is actually, like war eventually is going to hurt everyone and it's not, if, and it's not going to remain restricted to an India and Pakistan. So when we talk about solidarity, we wonder uh, where where is the journalistic solidarity? I mean, this conversation, um, I was thinking this morning that do we live in an insular world sometimes? Because I feel that a lot of times many of us are surrounded by others who we echo our own sentiments. And there is a very active rhetoric that is happening outside of these circles, which we're not able to actually have a dialogue with. And um, I'll pass it over now to maybe Ranuma to elaborate on that. But I just want to bring light to something related to the current situation. Um, Right after the attack, there was a there was a play that was supposed to uh, take place in uh, a government venue in Rajasthan, which was on the uh, which was on the Kashmir conflict, and uh, it was called Eidgah Ke Jannat, and it was talking about um, the stone pelters and the relate and and the whole atmosphere that has actually been continuing in Kashmir, it's not limited to this attack, it's decades, decades back. And there were massive protests outside the venue and they shut it down. And the, the play's director actually said that the lines that were objected to are actually verbatim from a soldier whose permission I have to quote him. Soldiers want to be heard, but these goons don't want to hear him. So who is actually bearing the brunt of the conflict? You know, he did a lot of research to go there and interview them and, and to bring the idea out to the people, but there is that repression, and at the end of the day, um, in many places, uh, these, these events do get shut down because the police said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't actually provide. If something goes wrong, we can't really provide any protection to you. So it's that atmosphere that is actually quite dangerous. And how in a, and it's something that uh, Mazumdar also said, who, who was the director of the play, where he said, the true test of any democracy is in enabling difficult conversations about issues on which there is difference of opinion among various people. It's that difference of opinion that we actually rarely see now in mainstream media. It seems to be one agenda that is, um, that is actually center stage. So, Ranma. Thank you. This is a common problem across South Asia, definitely. So now we have our Anuma. Uh, some of us, well, she used to write a column for, for our paper. So we, use, we, we usually call those who write columns, columnists, you know all. We used to call her pencilists because her columns were more, were sharper than the uh, pens, as if the, she writes with a sharp pencil. So we have Ranuma now to speak. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. I hadn't thought this would be as formal as it seems. So I have, um, I had thought this would be more of a discussion, and I'm sure it's going to be that. And to um, live in it up, I was thinking of reading out something I had written when this book of mine was published. This is the first collection of columns that I've written. And uh, let me read it out, because it has to do with my editor, Nurul Kobir. But it's not only about Kobir's courage, but also about the times that we live in now. OK, so let me read. When I had written this far, quotation, had Adivasi leader Cholis Richil died because members of the joint forces had plucked out his eyes, or was it because his testicles were removed? I thought to myself, nah, this won't get printed. No editor in his or her right mind would publish it. It was January 1st, 2008. We were under a state of emergency, had been so for nearly a year. 
I was in the middle of writing, remembering my first column for New Age. I hurriedly picked up my cell phone. I forget exactly what I texted Nurul Kabir, editor New Age, but given space constraints and my sense of urgency, it must have been something like this. I'm sorry, but I don't think you'll be able to publish what I'm writing. He replied immediately, please keep writing. Relieved, I returned to my keyboard, but not for long since the words which followed seemed far worse. Quotation. Or had Chollis Richil died of anus mutilation, end quote. My confidence wavered. I texted him again, no, no, you don't understand. Every sentence I write is tightly woven with its previous one. You won't be able to chop off sentences. It won't make any sense. My cell phone rang. It was Kabir, and I remember his words. Quotation. When you are writing, think that you are writing in the freest country in the world. Do not censor yourself. If ever there is a problem, I will invite you to my office. We will sit down and discuss it. No newspaper editor had uttered such words, neither to me nor any writer known to me, not then when a military-installed caretaker government was in power. Remembering was published exactly as I had handed it in, and in the five years that I've written for New Age, I haven't encountered any censorship. Now, my question to Kabir is, if I was writing now, 2019, and I had written those lines, and then I had texted him, what would he text me back? <laughs> no, no. This is the conversation that I think we should be having. It's not personal. I mean, obviously, it's given this Digital Security Act and things that have happened. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, <clears throat> we have a democratic so-called democratic government at the moment, but I would have, uh, as an editor, I would have again asked her to do that, but I would have given a second thought. Why? The situation, for example, uh, uh, the newspaper that I edit, is an English language newspaper called New Ways, by any fair uh, measurement, this is the second largest English language newspaper in this country. Two weeks ago, uh, or three weeks ago perhaps, I've been told my, uh, uh, my advertisement department that there is a government ranking up newspapers in terms of the circulation, which is very important for any uh, newspaper because that, uh, that ranking determines the, the uh, rate of advertisement that you receive. And in this particular part of the world, a revenue is a, is a major portion of the revenue for the newspapers come from advertisement. So I have been reduced to number 14. It suggests that from Dhaka, there are 13 other newspapers who are doing better in terms of circulation than New Age. So I asked my uh, colleague concerned, would you please give me the names of the 13 newspapers who are doing better than us in terms of circulation? I'm the circulation guy, he's supposed to keep it in mind. He couldn't. It took me two days to know that there are 13 more newspapers, even by name. So the message is, governments can twist the uh, hands of a publication in many ways, this is one of those. That's one. Second is that the ICT Act we were talking about, we have seen the crudely partisan application of the law. Say, so under ICT Act, uh, government has the authority to arrest someone or detain someone if he or she make some derogatory comments about the government leaders or, or serious, or who, who, of whom they feel very important. And under this law, the people have been arrested, only those who have been critical about the government's actions and inactions in different, at different times. 
There are a lot of examples in the Facebook and the other uh, media, uh, electronic media organizations, online editions of government propaganda machine, that they are doing hate campaign against those uh, dissident voices and opposition political parties and leaders and activists. None have been arrested for that. So, a newspaper which has, uh, this, uh, w with the, uh, what is it called? I mean, the, uh, Print, we, we, along with the print version, as we have the online version as well. So even for the sake of others, for the sake of this existence of the organization, for its survival a little longer, I have to give a, a second thought whether maybe I will be requesting our uh, pencilist that can't you please find a synonym of this particular word or why can't you write in a, a little different way? Yes, this is the situation. Why this, this is the situation? Because a lot of depoliticization has also been taking place in our society. Freedom of express has, has a lot to do with the uh, politis, uh, politicization, right politicization of the people at large. We have a government here in place. Ten years back it came to power or uh, it rather refused to leave power, I should rather say. There was 350 constituencies, parliamentary constituencies, 153 uh, uh, of, to form any form a government, a political party or an alliance needs at least 151 seats under their command. In 154 constituencies, there was no contestant. And then, because of the because of different uh, political and organizational weakness, or the strategical weakness of the of the opposition parties, they could retain power. Then, after five years, we have a government which was elected, quote unquote, elected, in which most of the ruling party members and sympathizers couldn't vote. Forget about the opposition and the uh, party neutral people or the political parties on the left because it was being done by the administration and the police. So under such circumstances, a government has to become authoritarian because the, a, this kind of a government doesn't have public support, doesn't have any standing among the people, even they don't uh, enjoy the sympathy and support of the supporters and uh, low-level activists of their own parties. So under such circumstances, the, all the state machinery becomes coercive. Under the coercive mechanism, this is not just uh, the question of saving myself or my colleagues regularly working in the uh, newspaper, but it is also my responsibility to save my great friend, a great writer, Ranuma, too. So I would have, uh, my answer to his hard question is, I would have this time given a second thought. Thank you. That's how, thing, how bad things are. That's how bad things are. <laughs> See, when I went to, um, yesterday when I dropped in at Kobir's to remind him, this is, see, truth is always, there are many versions of it, so Kobir has had his version. I went to remind him that he was, uh, we expected him today. And um, then he said, well, as Bangladeshis, we don't have much to say. Basically, no freedom, no expression. So we'll ask our South Asian colleagues to inform us how things are slightly better there. And um, I, would like to, um, I would like to bring in several things. I'm the only one who's not a journalist here, though because of my columns, some have mistaken me for a journalist. But um, as a writer, as a researcher, as an anthropologist and um, activist in various other hats that I wear, um, See, when, when we're talking about freedom and expression, um, what, 
uh, one of the usual things, I mean, many, many things have come up which do not have only to do with the Digital Security Act, but as Tanvi said, lack of solidarity between journalists and many other factors, or being, as, as Kabir pointed out, that there are other mechanisms that uh, those who rule, who can uh, enact those or implement those mechanisms in order to make, in order to restrict in order to put you in your place, like being number 14 from number two. But in Bangladesh, I think, beside Digital Security Acts and other laws that are very anti-people and uh, constrict our freedom, uh, the contradictions in the Constitution, as, as Kabir pointed out, there are three other things that to me are um, I think um, enact, uh, take away people's freedom and really create um, uh, an atmosphere of fear. One is the crossfire industry. Uh, I think um, uh, it's called encounter in, in India and I'm sure people know about it where um, basically law enforcing agencies, uh, the way it's reported in the newspapers is like this person who was arrested was trying to flee, and then we were forced to shoot him and died, and that is a crossfire, or you know, was, was shooting at us and therefore. Um, so that's basically a crossfire industry that really instills fear. Secondly, the smear industry, and there's really a smear industry, I think, I think it, it um, I think it's unique in, in Bangladesh, the smear industry, and it's very close. Somehow, it is always in tandem with uh, what the ruling party or the government's agenda is. Um, and that smear industry is also very, very effective. And I would also say the Mukti Juttu industry, by which I mean that the ideals and the liberation war itself has been turned into an industry and cultural activists, the whole cultural industry is busy churning out plays and a whole range of other things to do with the Mukti Jutta, but not critical of how far we have moved away from the ideals of the liberation war itself. So that the third one is the Mukti Jutta industry. There are other things, um, I think, um, I think what, what uh, we also need to be able to talk about is how the media, of course, is not homogenous as has, I mean, you know, it has come up in what our journalists, what my journalist friends have said. It's not homogenous. Uh, Tanvi said that mainstream media has been bought, uh, has been totally sold out. But in Bangladesh, you have um, televisions, particular channels broadcasting overheard conversations or conversations that have been recorded between politicians and that are broadcast. So private conversations between people who happen to be dissidents or the government doesn't like, and they are regularly broadcast on the media. And so there are particular TV channels and particular online newspapers and published newspapers which act as an extension of the state. I don't know how it is in, in Nepal and India, but I would like our friends from there to talk about that, um, which is why I think that things are really bad here. And the other, another aspect that I would like to bring to this conversation is that somehow artists, the big, large artist industry, the intellectual, uh, the intellectuals, and you know that ranges from let's say TV uh, playwrights to um, uh, to cinema to all kinds of the culture industry in the in the in the broadest possible sense, how they don't feel threatened by Digital Security Act, or let's say architects, or let's say any group of people who don't, and I really wonder what is it that they produce that they don't feel threatened, and which means that they don't exercise freedom. 
freedom is only for journalists to exercise. So what is it? I mean, like when Kunda was talking at the you know, inaugural ceremony today, he was saying that it is the newspapers, it is the media that brings the truth. And it is they who are defending freedom. But I think freedom should be for everyone to defend, for everyone to exercise, for everyone to discover. Um, and why? And that is exactly, I think, part of the problem that it has become. And as as Tanvi says, the media is um, is not large sections of the media are not respected, which is also why the social media is is seen to be more authentic. But at the same time, the social media is you know there are trolls and there is a lot of it's very effective in terms of um, generating hate. So we are living in very um, in very difficult times and the problem here is very crude as as uh, uh, Kobir, uh, Kobir put it what I would like to add with this is just as fear is uh, very contagious I think courage is also contagious and I think that when people do resist, when they do dissent, when they do come forward and say that I, I have the right to say this and I will say it, um, that can also inspire people. That can also inspire people and we do come forward. So that's, that's all for now. Thanks. We have, particularly uh, Ranum and myself have given you some glimpses of the state of affairs that we are exposed to. Ranum has a right to know, perhaps, that's, and have the uh, and and the need to have some exchange of notes as regards what are the practical conditions uh, in Nepal and India. Is that better? If it's better, how could you they manage it, and we can learn from them. Or if it's really, really similar, if not same, we need to know, uh, we need the uh, flow to invite, S give us uh, suggestions. What can we do as Ranu has already pointed out? Freedom of speech and freedom of expression is, cannot be the sole responsibility or duty of the journalist because this affects the entire society. Rather, the society, entire so the society at large needs the democratic freedom of the journalists and others, writers, thinkers, so that they can uh, progress as a society towards the uh, further democratic transformation of their own society and the state. So we need to talk, we need to exchange, exchange our views, need our suggestions more. So may I now request again with us, our friends from Nepal and India to have some more say about it. Um, Ranama, something that you mentioned uh, about the artists actually, uh, you know, how the response from that community has been. Um, I have a few examples that um, I was trying to wrestle up in my mind, um, which are, especially within the photography community, who has been responding to the current climate and who hasn't. And I struggled to find names of people who have actually responded in a way that has made the establishment uncomfortable. And that uh, the, the form of it operates in different ways. And, and I'll give you a few examples. So um, before the 2014 elections in India, where the current uh, government came into being, there were riots that happened in 2013 in Muzaffarnagar in Uttar Pradesh, in a state in North India. Now, um, it was not a coincidence that those elections hap uh, that the riots happened right before the elections. Uh, there was a filmmaker by the name of Nakul Singh Soni who went and interviewed, uh, who went back to Muzaffarnagar about two months after the riots and went and interviewed people diligently for a film that he sought to make. And a lot of the opinion that um, that was quite evident was that the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the party that did come into power, uh, they were instrumental in using the riots to forward their own agenda for coming into power, 
but the government that was in power at the time didn't do anything to make the situation better. So everyone was really culpable. Now, and this was, these were riots where uh, 100 people were killed. Uh, the majority was Muslim, uh, but there were Hindus as well, but 80,000 people were displaced. So when he went ahead and made this film, and it was called Muzaffar Nagar Baki Hai, the screening of the film was a nightmare because he just had no venue that would be willing to screen it. So there is a college by the name of Kirori Mal College, which is a part of Delhi University. Uh, when he screened it there, uh, there's this student wing of the uh, of the Bharti Janda Party called the Akhil Bharti uh, Vidyarthi Parishad, the ABVP, and there were a lot of um, people that collected outside the screening and staged massive protests and. Um, they were literally looking for Nakul and in a way to you know, corner him and do what they wanted. Uh, the screening was completely shut down and never took place. What Nakul did in that situation was that he partnered with a group called Cinemas of Resistance and said, I offer my film for free to be screened anywhere across the country. All you need to do is just take it. And then the film was screened in homes, in, in classrooms, amongst 10 people, amongst 100 people. And he managed to do this, but even in this process, it it was interesting how the the responses that he was receiving. In Chennai, it was cancelled because the police flatly refused to offer any security in case anything went wrong. Um, Madura and Trichy screenings were disrupted. In Bengal, which is the Vishwabharati uh, in, uh, school in Shanti Niketan, um, they said that, oh, we can't, uh, we can't screen this film because it might threaten the communal harmony within the educational institute. And that itself has been quite interesting to see that even within educational institutions, debate and dissent is being shut down. I mean, those are the places where these discussions are meant to take place. Now, if that very institution is saying, oh, you can't screen this film, even you may not agree with the political ideology, but the fact that that's quite that's being contained, and in Mumbai, it was um, you know it was a technical glitch that happened, and so the venue had to be changed last minute. So, um, Hanakul's film was something that was responding to the moment. And he, as a practitioner, took it upon himself that if the outlet doesn't exist, I'm going to create it. However, um, on the complete opposite side, we've also seen a lot of self-censorship that has been happening. Um, because you said, uh, you were talking about whether you wrote, if you wrote the same article now and you sent it to Kabir, what his reaction would be. Um, I noticed something with a, uh, with a colleague of mine who's a Kashmiri photographer, and he's been working on half widows. The term half widows is for mothers and uh, sisters of the people who have disappeared, and they're called half widows because the fate of uh, the man is unknown, whether they have died or, you know, they, they still hold out a hope uh, that they will return. And this is, uh, you know, the crossfire industry that you're speaking about is very much at play within Kashmir. Now, uh, this Kashmiri photographer was thankfully got funding from a uh, from an American organization to be able to do his work, and there are 8,000 people that are missing in Kashmir. He went, he documented um, the half widows for over three years, and then I wrote. I had seen the work floating around somewhere on some fund website and all of that. And so I asked him, I said that, would you be willing to publish this with us? And there was absolute shock because he said. I, uh, he said, I didn't think that any Indian publication would be interested in running this. And, um, and I was like, have you tried? And he said, well, I approached one and clearly there was a clear no because it is a narrative that no media house wants to put forward because it does question the establishment as to where are these 8,000 people. And these women are living testimonies of the disappearances that have occurred. But he did say that I didn't, you know, he said that I went to a New York Times and I published it there, but the audience that is really going to get irked by it is in India. And there was a part of him that wasn't even, he said, you know, I'm not even going to approach many Indian publications to do it. So there is a lot of self-censorship that has been taking place. Um, there's also, I don't know if there's much to learn from the situation in India because it's quite depressing. Um, Recently, um, we've also seen another way in which the state is manifesting its power is by controlling the cultural institutions themselves. So the people who are meant to head the cultural institutions are being, um, as in they're putting their own people in those positions. So uh, I, I assume it's similar here. Um, uh, 
incidentally, there's a there's an exhibition going on right now at the National Museum in Delhi, which uh, which is on the gifts that the Prime Minister has received from across the world, and it's a I mean it's a ridiculous exhibition, but it's been extended because of the great uh, response that it has received. Now the National Museum is going ahead and and putting up these exhibitions. The NGMA, which is the National Gallery of Modern Art, recently hosted an exhibition of. Um, Prabhakar Bharve, I forget his, yeah, Prabhakar Bharve, whose show was on, and Amol Palikar, who is a, uh, who is an actor, uh, and a, and was also in Marathi theatre. He he was invited to speak at the opening, so he took the opportunity to talk about the fact that. Till now, there was there is there has been a loss of independence in the art gallery's ways of functioning, and he said that um, until October last year, the NGMA had an active advisory committee of local artists that would decide what shows would take place. That committee has been disbanded, and the Ministry of Culture has come into play, and they will appoint their own person. And he was speaking, and he was constantly interrupted, and then basically told to stop his speech and step down. Thankfully, it's the age of, I mean, this is where social media works. The, somebody recorded that conversation, and it went viral. Um, but it's not just one NGMA. It's not just one national museum. It's, it's uh, you know, the FTI, which is a film school in, um, in Pune, they, you know, they're trying to put their people there. So it's not just in it's not just in cultural spaces. It's in educational institutes, and actually, it's a very well thought out program of controlling all the spaces where you can stifle any kind of dissent. Um, and then you wonder that is it it is the state that is introducing the repression, but where are th where are the voices? Is it is it the self censorship that is containing the voices of the artists, or is it the fear that um, there is no outlet now to show your work? Um, there's a work that's here. I know Gori Gill's work that is showing of the 1984, the, the aftermath of the 1984 uh, Sikh violence violence against Sikhs that uh, happened in Delhi. Now, one thing very interesting that Gauri has done uh, is that she has made that work publicly available. You can download the PDF and you can. You, you have access to these testimonies. Now, Gauri is an artist who works with uh, a gallery. And usually, um, you know, artists don't want to give out their work for free. But when you do a certain kind of work and it stays contained within the walls of a gallery or, the walls, or, or just you know, a single time exhibition, what is the value of that work? So do we need to create our own spaces? Um, because it's definitely not coming from the mainstream. But Great ideas have actually always come out of the margins. So there's still some amount of hope there. So Kundab, maybe you could talk a bit about Nepal. I've lost track of what the question was. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I derailed it a bit. But I think the, this building reminds me of democracy. You know, it's work in progress. And it's, it's something that we've inherited from our colonial past. Um, from our colonizers who themselves are going through a democratic crisis in their own countries, where their own press is uh, being undermined um, through populism. So um, we, uh, with the West weakening, uh, the voice of our two large neighbors is uh, automatically more powerful uh, for, I mean, India and China. And their economic model and political model then has more of a clout. Uh, in our region. And I think that a lot of what we're seeing with our governments today is a result, I think, of the weakening of the West and the models of democracy and parliamentary democracy and press freedom that we got from there. Now, India used to be the bulwark where in case press freedom and democracy was threatened, we could always lean on India's tradition of free press being the world's largest democracy uh, and, you know, with a tradition, long tradition of free press, but India itself is being undermined from within. Um, so we are losing friends for our value systems. Um, and I, th I think this crisis in democracy also coincides with a crisis in the media itself. Uh, our, our entire revenue model in the mass media is collapsing. And this is across the world. Uh, and this is due to internet and everything else that's happened. The, the eyeballs have migrated to online, to mobile. Uh, but the advertisers haven't. 
and the subscription model doesn't work. The paywalls don't work. So we're in this transition where the old media is really sick and in intensive care, and the new media has just been born. Uh, and therefore, in this weak state, it then becomes very easy for the powers that be that want to control the media to grab it. And, and there are many ways they do it, I think, and because of the economic weakness of our media, uh, it's very easy for them to do that now. But even in countries where the media is strong and, and econ economically powerful and independent financially, they have been undermined. And the way governments use the methods are quite common to our countries. I think they, they buy into media. Uh, they can easily use the media industrial complex uh, to influence the content of media. They use threats and uh, smears and uh, trolling uh, very effectively. Uh, the bot factories are extremely active in our region especially to go after uh, female columnists and, and commentators. And, um, and or they go after circulation, like has happened to the dawn in Pakistan, where they just go after the bicycle boys. Um, or uh, they use the anti-defamation laws or libel, as has happened to Rappler in the Philippines and Maria Ressa. Uh, so they have, a, they have a lot of weapons in their arsenal uh, to go after us, and I think the only way we can counter it is, as you mentioned, I think it's domestic and international solidarity. Now, when we went through a crisis, it was, we were lucky because we had uh, fantastic domestic solidarity among other media, civil society, and human rights organizations who understood that it wasn't just the media's freedom they were protecting or speaking out against or defending, but it was the citizens' right to know that was being threatened. And the media was just the messenger that was being targeted at that time. So I think that, that solidarity really worked and ultimately led to um, the agencies of government to back down. Uh, but it doesn't work in every country, I know, and therefore then international solidarity then becomes important. But there is a limit to what you can do with international solidarity when the populism is influenced and probably driven by xenophobia, especially anti-Western xenophobia. Then it becomes very easy for the powers that be to say, oh, well, they were all getting their euros and dollars. They were all funded from abroad anyway. So, uh, you know, and, and, and any speaking out by a foreign embassy then affects um, the credibility of the of the person being persecuted as well. So there's a limit to it, but I think uh, in the end, there's always, it's always a form of defense to have very um, um, widespread international presence. Even if people don't speak out, the fact that you have, uh, you have that base internationally is a form of protection. Well, all of you have a hard our problems rather than a solution. So you, in the audience may have your questions, suggestions, comments. So I open the floor for, uh, for you. Anyone, please just uh, raise your hands, put forward your identity, name, and any comment, question, anything. Thank you. Like the thing that must, must happen 
case. We cannot stop that. So now the condition is that things are going to happen. So how do we prepare face those problems? As journalists, how do you think we should write? How do you think we should express? If we know that things, the bad things are going to happen. Thank you. That's what we are we, seeking for. I think the power of satire and ridicule should not be underestimated. And I don't know about here, but in our country, for some reason, the cartoonists were left alone for a long time until the government sort of found out that, hey, these are powerful messages coming out through the cartoons. Um, so I think uh, comedy, satire, look at Trump's America today, the highest rated news program is not the evening news anymore, it's the comedy programs. So, if I can add to him, while a repressive situation always provides the opportunity to the people to be creative, uh, creative in terms of finding different words, different medium uh, to uh, register protest, but at the same time, that the question of uh, self-censorship, why is, that, for example, for a newspaper, for me, or any other reader for that matter, a newspaper is a collective work. The Dranuma put forward the question, if I ask the same question to, the, to my colleagues, because I, one cannot bring out a newspaper of 25 pages every day alone. So several years back, the way my same, same colleagues used to behave. I remember when the emergency was promulgated, I just called, up, called a meeting, spoke for a few minutes, and decided, no matter what, no, no matter who, what other papers or uh, television or radios do, we'll protest. Everybody agreed. Fourteen years after that, I now hear gossips or, say, whispers in the canteen of the office or uh, in the downstairs. Well, situation is not that good. Well, those days, our five feet, four inch guy with 50 kgs could save us. Would it be, would it he be able this time to save us? What do you do? Most of them are not be coming out to ask the question to me. If they come, I can give some, some answers or I can try to. But self-censorship is such a thing. They will not come up with the questions as well. Because they have seen over the, uh, over the uh, last 10 years, more than 1,000 people have been disappeared. Many of them are, are, are killed in uh, what is called crossfire. So now, uh, and all of them, all, most of them, I mean 99% of them were on the opposition camp or they call, or is the so-called hardened criminals. People have to accept, or we have to communicate to the people that even a hardened criminal has to be tried, and uh, I mean, state has the right to kill, but through certain legal process, through the trial in the public court. Since that has not been uh, upheld by the state, so a pervasive sense of fear stands in the way of expressing things. I would rather, if, you, if I can take a little, little more time, answer the question in a different way. So I have my friends too, who love me. So they ask me, why you have to do the, all these things? I ask them a few questions. There, in Bangladeshi context, every time we hear, every day, several times, the, the, in Bangla it's called Mukti Juddhir Chetana, Spirit of the Liberation War. Anyone opposing the deeds, uh, misdeeds and inactions or uh, autocratic actions of the government, he or she is being identified as anti-liberation force. You know it. Now I, I used to say, I just talk about liberation force issues. Why? It's the 10th of April 1972, 1971, when the war commenced. The government in exile uh, called up the people to take part in the liberation war, saying what? The war will create a democratic republic. If you fight the war, the, the, the end of the war, a democratic republic will be created.
And there's a one-liner. What will be the responsibility of the Republic? Uh, equality, social justice, and human dignity. That's the liberation war spirit. Today, 47 years after that, when every day we, heard from, we hear from the government quarters, the decisions are into liberation forces, we need to say, not the journalists, the people as well. Because 82% of the total armed freedom fighters came from poor classes of the people. That's government statistics. From the poor peasantry and the uh, industrial uh, workers. 82%. Now, at this moment, last year, la December last year, government figure, government figure, the 5% of the top rich and the 5% of the top, uh, uh, of, the five of the poor, the inequality of income is 102 to two, three times. So we have to fight the liberation war spirit by giving the statistics provided by the government. Now you are talking about the liberation war and you have the monopoly over the history saying that you have led the war, which is correct. And you will be doing these things in the name of liberation war. This cannot be accepted, not just as a journalist, as a citizen too. So that's why I say publicly, I write publicly in Bangla and in English that liberation war spirit has to be freed from their war milling. I say Islamic values, the egalitarian aspects of the Islamic values have to be freed from the Islamic parties that we have. I say that nationalists, we have a nationalist party. The, 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 the nationalism has also to be freed from the nationalist party because when they are in trouble, they don't go to the people. They go to the different embassies to, to get their problem solved. So we have all our nationalism, liberals to war, and the religious values are at stake. So if, if these, are the, these are the values that the people had fought for. So is this now, Mr. Young Man, I ask you, is this the job of a journalist, just journalist, that they will be raising the question, or the whole people for the sake of their own survival, for their own dignity, for their own aspirations for democracy and equality? This is the responsibility of all people. So as Ranuma pointed out, that one of the prime challenges of the democratically oriented journalists or uh, intellectuals in this country, perhaps in Saudi, uh, so entire South Asia too, that the cause they are fighting for is not their selfish uh, professional cause. This is the cause of the entire people. And if you, we can take this fight intellectually, to that end, someday we will have public mobilization on the basis of those thoughts and in, intell uh, intellectual views, and we would really have the cherished society that all of us are working for. Thank you. Can I just have just a, just a quick word. This is in response to your uh, to the point that you made about using satire and caricature. Fortunately, in India, we also have someone like Orijit Sen, mm -hmm. who has mm -hmm. gone all out and he's done some brilliant work and continues to do so. Not at the NGMA perhaps, but we have a space like the Kochi Biennale where his works are shown. So at least there is that. But in a, at the Kochi Biennale as well, even though Kochi hasn't been hit that much by repression as yet, but the work that was shown at Kochi was actually much more innocuous than the other work, that, than the political work that he does. So till now, I mean, there's a wide range of his work and it was the Goa series that was shown. It was, the, it was a work on community is safer in the way that it was presented, that it was shown, but his political work, which is very clearly going against certain people in the government, that the space that that has found is actually social media. And that's how it has how kind of yeah, it's, it's been disseminated. And yes, that's also but I had one thing to also add to uh, your question. Um, satire, definitely, I, I, I really kind of stand by that answer. But um, I also saw that in a place like Iran, uh, where after the Islamic Revolution, uh, there has been quite a lot of uh, curtailment of freedom of speech. But artists have somehow managed to use that as fodder to create work, which is um, actually m might be much more interesting than if things were things when you know these restrictions didn't exist because the work is constantly responding to the restrictions and they're finding ways to go around them and it it can seemingly actually look very beautiful because a lot of it and 
and I'm talking specifically about a lot of photo-based art that I saw, um, the aesthetics are actually quite pictorial, uh, taking from a lot of uh, Iranian art history. But when you actually start reading and peeling off the various layers, the work is very, very political. And they're using, basically they're using the restrictions to feed the work. And I think that's very important for artists to do. Um, there's an artist over there, Azadeh Akhlagi, who had done, um, uh, who had staged 17 deaths that had happened in Iran since I think the first coup d'etat, which was 1908 or 1905, I might be wrong on my year, uh, up until the Islamic Revolution. So um, uh, these 17 deaths actually have no photograph uh, that has been made of the death itself. So she, the work is called By an Eyewitness, and she collected various um, records, which are eyewitness records, spoke to family members of the deceased, went to architects to find out what was the color of a building in 1911 because there was no color photography at the time. And then she built a, she built a repository of research. And the more material that she found, she found that she was getting further and further away from the truth. And eventually, what she put out, I mean, her work is um, also requires a lot of collaboration. It has 300 people making one photograph. But the work that she eventually put out, she said that it's her perspective of how she sees history. When they were, um, and just kind of an extended response to your question, but um, in Iran, all of the work that is shown in galleries or in public spaces has to be vetted by a censor board. So what they did was, and granted the place that she was showing with has political connections in a way that they could manage to do this somehow, that they were meant to send the material to the censor board. They didn't send it. Uh, they announced the opening at 6 p.m., but through their channels, they opened the show at 3. So the crowds had already come in. And the work is very active in public memory. And it was the first time a photograph was shown of the deaths of any of these people. By the time the Basij, which is the model police, came, um, there were too many people already at the gallery to then shut down the show. Because had they done that, it would have caused an even bigger crisis. So artists are using um, the system somehow to respond to it. And I think that is kind of the responsibility of us as artists to to use this particular moment to do that. So. Uh, just an addendum. By the way, while in certain, is this kind of times, cartoonists, painters and other artists can do a great job, it does not exonerate the writers and other social activists uh, to sit idle. By the way.